In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. Welcome to the program of Bible study In Search of the Lord's Way. We're honored, my friend, that you joined us today. It's our sincerest prayer that you be blessed by it. We're always encouraged when we hear from you that the program has been a blessing to you. Because we're beginning in new areas today, some of you will be seeing the program for the first time, and you should know that we're presented by your caring neighbors and friends in Churches of Christ, not as a commercial enterprise, not as entertainment, but as a ministry, because we love you. Let me ask you, what makes us human? If after a visit to the zoo, we ask our small child to describe a giraffe, what do you suppose he'd say? That's the animal with a long neck, four long legs. Would he describe the elephant as the huge gray colored one with a tail or trunk in front? Would he identify the leopard by his spots and the ze a zebra by his stripes? The peacock as the bird with the beautifully colored feathers and the snake as the long slender creature that slithers along on his tummy. If you ask him to identify a human being, what do you suppose he'd say? Would he say, he's the one with only two legs that walks upright and wears clothes most of the time instead of feathers, furs, or fins? Has a vocabulary and talks? Would he identify man as the wise one or the thinking one, homo sapien, the one with a brain and intelligence, the inventor, the discoverer, the ingenious one? What is there about us that makes us separate from the other creatures? Are we all cut from the same cloth, made from the same mud? I wonder how many adults could answer that question to their own satisfaction. Don't you think we need to know what makes us human beings? Or are we just animals with our own distinguishing physical characteristics, like the giraffe with his long neck, the elephant with a trunk, and the zebra with his stripes, and the leopard with his spots? Well, the title of our program today is What It Means to Be Human. Ken Heldebrand will lead us in a hymn, then I'll be back. Sing
I'm reading from the eighth Psalm of David. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and all the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we're so thankful that today we can come to you not only as our Creator, but also because we're your offspring, we can pray to you as our Father who art in heaven. We're thankful, Father, that we are made different from all of the beasts of the field in that we do reflect that image of deity in our lives. Help us to realize that and appreciate it. Help us to find our identity in you today as we study from your word, in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. My friend, I really believe with all my heart that the very root cause of many of the problems we're having in our American society in this last decade of the 20th century is that we just don't know what it means to be a human being. Since the Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee in 1925, we've been educated that human beings are mere animals, having evolved from the lower animal species. We're different only in some physical qualities from those that you see in the zoo. And I'm just as convinced that until we discover who we are and esteem ourselves higher than the jungle beast, the law of the jungle will prevail and we we'll go along that way, assaulting one another, killing, beating, robbing, raping, and hating one another. I'm convinced there'll be no major solution to the suffering of mankind until we reach some understanding of who we are, what the purpose of creation was, what happens after death. Until these questions are resolved in our own minds, we are caught. But we're also caught when we try to explain our humanity apart from God. It isn't enough to argue that a human being is different from the animals at the zoo only in his chemical and physical complexity. We don't expect of the animals, not even our pets, rationality, 
inventiveness, creativity, ingenuity, morality, responsibility, and, and we don't hold them accountable as we do people, do we now? If the story we read from the Bible a while ago is not the true story of the origin of man, we simply do not know how we came to be. The evolution of man is only a theory, mere speculation, and not a scientifically proven fact and shouldn't be understood or taught that way. While humanity has some things in common with the animals, there's this that's decidedly different. We have been created to enjoy a unique and special relationship with God. When God had made the man and the woman, He walked with them and talked with them in the garden. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Even after we've broken that lovely relationship by sinning against God, God still loves us and has provided the way of reconciliation for us. We are the offspring of God, according to Acts chapter 17, verses 28 and 29. He is our Father, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. So we are a reflection of God's image, not in what we do, but in who we are. That's what makes us human beings, and that's what makes human life sacred. So sacred is the life of a human that God exacts the severest measure of punishment possible on the person who takes the life of an innocent human being. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, he says, Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For, and here's the reason, in the image of God made he man. Recognition and acceptance of the sanctity of human life is the solution to many of our national problems. I don't have time to discuss all of them today, but the single most critical problem faced by the American society right now, this year, this week, is the protection of all human life. Some politicians and others would divert our attention from this number one overriding concern by deluging us with a constant harangue about jobs, the economy, national health plans, and other materialistic concerns. Well, as important as these things are, the matter of highest priority right now is, will the conscience of America continue to tolerate the continued killing of so large a number of innocent, helpless, defenseless human beings whose only crime is that they're unwanted. Just like the Dred Scott decision in 1857, that decision of the Supreme Court that denied equal protection to black people, Roe versus Wade of 1973 is wrong, and it must be reversed. It's wrong, my friend. It's morally wrong, just as wrong as Dred Scott. And it can be reversed just in the same way that Red Scott was reversed, when the conscience of the nation cries out, the human holocaust must end. We can never build or sustain an orderly society in which some segments of human life are not held sacred. President Ronald Reagan, in his book, Abortion and the Conscience of the Nation, said, we cannot diminish the value of one category of human life, the unborn, without diminishing the value of all human life. The real question, according to Mr. Reagan, is whether that tiny human life has a God-given right to be protected by the law, the same right that we have. And he continued with a word of warning, the cultural environment for a human holocaust is present wherever any society can be misled into defining individuals as less than human and therefore devoid of value and respect. Well, he's right. We all know he's right. At this point, I'm reminded of those off-quoted words of Martin Niemöller, the German theologian during Hitler's regime, in Germany, he said, the Nazis first came for the communists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. 
Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak for me. Once a society has licensed any person or group of persons to, at their own choosing, take the life of other persons, the license to kill cannot be contained. Richard John Newhouse, editor of First Things, wrote in the December 1991 issue of that magazine that all civilized societies sharply restrict the permissions given for one person to kill another. They do not recognize private agreements for the person to take the life of another in order to serve the interests of one party or both. For our own selfish interests then, as well as the interest we have in the survival of our civilization, we just simply cannot, we must not license any person to kill or to assist in the killing of an innocent human being, whether the preborn, the newborn, the sick, the elderly, for whatever noble purpose may be claimed. Because once such a license is granted, the practice quickly spreads from those cases in which the decision is easy to those in which it's difficult. Human life is cheapened and the difficult cases become easy. It's only one short step from abortion, killing the unborn, to infanticide, killing the newborn baby then on to mercy killing, then on to assisted suicide, then to euthanasia, and on and on to genocide, the killing off of anyone or any group of persons who for any reason, color of skin perhaps, national origin, maybe religious faith, just any segment of society, certain ones of us don't feel should live. If we don't put a stop to it now, there may not be anyone left to speak up when they get around to you and me. In 1984, Dr. C. Everett Koop, the distinguished Surgeon General of the United States at that time said, without going into all the details, I express concern that abortion of somewhere between a million and two million unborn babies a year would lead to such cheapening of human life that infanticide would not be far behind. Well, you all know, he said, this is a quote, that infanticide is being practiced right now in this country. That was almost 10 years ago. And I'm assuming that the Surgeon General knew what he was writing about. Need I remind you of Dr. Death in Michigan who continues his practice of assisting people in suicide? We're on the very brink of the general acceptance of euthanasia. But we ask, what about a woman's right over her own body to do with it what she chooses to do? That's a private matter. We hear it said, I don't think it's the govern a government's business to become involved in my personal choices in my personal life. My friend, civilized people have always recognized limitations of personal rights and liberties. These same people, the feminists, who heard protesting so loudly government's interference with a woman's rights in choice and something in a personal nature as abortion, demand government interference in a man's choice in cases of rape and incest and sexual harassment. And rightly so, because these are crimes against other people, innocent people, and so is abortion. It's a crime against an innocent, helpless baby. It's always been one purpose of government to establish restraints on hu human behavior so as to pre protect the innocent and the helpless. Have you never heard the expression, your freedom ends where my nose begins? You know what it means, don't you? Your First Amendment right of free speech does not give you the right to say and to publish slanderous things about other people. 
Freedom of the press doesn't license people to print their own money, for example. Though it is your own body, you don't have the right to use it to seduce a minor child into sexual activity. A man or woman known to be infected with the, the HIV virus is not free with his own body to knowingly expose another person. A person whose blood alcohol content is measured at more than 0.1% is not free to drive a car. It really isn't a matter of freedom of choice. It's a matter of right and responsibility and accountability. Remember, we were talking a while ago about what it means to be human. We said some of the things that distinguishes human beings from the animals are responsibility, morality, and accountability. We don't expect these things of our pets because they're mere animals, but we do expect them of the human beings because we are the offspring of God. We reflect the image of God our Father. God expects us to act responsibly, to do right, and he holds us accountable. We have but to recall a bit of modern history. Some of it's so recent we can remember it and so gruesome we can never forget it. To know the bitter end of nations of people who refuse to acknowledge God and to protect the dignity and sanctity of human life. There was Nazi Germany under Hitler who burned some eight million Jews and how many more unwanted, disabled, sick, elderly, and helpless others the world has never yet known. It's no secret that the Soviet Union under the 70-year reign of atheistic communism, especially during the regimes of uh, Stalin and Khrushchev, slaughtered so many more millions of its own people as to make Hitler's ovens look like a backyard cookout. The point is, where are those once powerful nations now? But who are we Americans to point a finger of scorn since Roe versus Wade in, John, in January 1973, there have been almost 30 million little innocent, helpless, preborn human beings legally killed right here in the United States of America, much of it with your tax dollars and my dollars. Perhaps you're asking, as I have, why doesn't somebody do something about this senseless slaughter of human life? Well, finally it dawned on me, you're somebody. Then I ask myself, what can I do? I'm just one ordinary citizen. I'll be back in a moment with my answer. Father, we thank you for the dignity of being your children, your offspring. Help us to be ever conscious and aware that all human life is such. In Jesus' name, amen. can I do and what can you do to turn this cruel abortion problem around? Well, first we can pray. 
There's power in prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. No one's going to do much about anything that isn't, that isn't important enough to pray about. God can do more with the hearts and actions of people than both of us can. Second, we can become informed citizens of our society and assume our appropriate share of responsibility for the way things are. We don't have to settle for slanted views that are fed to us by our news information and entertainment media. Third, we can accompany our prayers with action. We can let our religious and political and social and health care leaders know that abortion is intolerable. We will no longer sit quietly while a few people propagate such an evil upon us and our children. We can give support to the leadership we have who are standing against the evil, and we can choose leaders who will give the sanctity of human life highest priority in their agenda and uh, who will join us in purging ourselves of this national shame. Fourth, we can become actively engaged in caring for the many unwanted babies born instead of aborted. There are one and a half million abortions every year, but there are two million couples wanting to adopt babies. Fifth, but very important, we can all be Christians and follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and so avoid the need for an abortion. His is the best way to live the world has ever known. If you're not a Christian, I beg you in simple trusting faith to turn in repentance and baptism at once. And let's join hands in our march to heaven's glory. If you'd like to study the text of this message more closely, you may obtain a printed copy or an audio cassette tape of it by addressing In Search in the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083. Or you may call us on our toll-free telephone number 1-800-321-8633. We're happy you were with us today. I hope you've been blessed by this study. May God bless you and keep you through the week. We love you.